In 2022, a state law took effect in New York governing the potential occurrence of a likely human carcinogen in personal care, cosmetic, and household products. The law, which addresses the presence of 1,4-dioxane, was the subject of finalized regulations this fall from the State Department of Environmental Conservation. To discuss this evolving landscape, we're joined in the Capitol Press Room by Connor Shea, Section Supervisor for the Pollution Prevention Unit of the DEC's Division of Materials Management. Welcome to the show, Connor. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. Thanks for making the time. So for starters, can you explain what 1,4-dioxane is and why it has been used, at least in the past, in everyday products on the shelves in New York? So 1,4-dioxane is something that was historically used as a solvent in the manufacture of other chemicals, and it was also used as a laboratory chemical in some cases. However, it's something that also turns up as a byproduct during the production of some chemicals. So, for example, during the ethoxylation process that's used to make certain surfactant chemicals that are used in things like cosmetics, detergents, and shampoos, 1,4-dioxane might be produced during that ethoxylation process. And it's this unintended byproduct that ends up turning up in those pretty common consumer products. And how widespread has the presence been historically? Is this something that has been just an everyday part of cosmetics and household products, or has it only occurred in certain products on the shelves? So it occurs most often in products with those ethoxylated surfactant ingredients. So if you look at the label on a product and it contains these three magic letters, ETH, as part of one of the ingredients. So you might look at the back of a shampoo bottle and see an ingredient like sodium laureth sulfate. And that is an indicator of this ethoxylation process. And those types of ingredients with that ETH, that ethoxylation of an ingredient, those are the ones that are of particular concern when it comes to 1,4-dioxane showing up as as a byproduct. And I want to talk now about the concerns about 1,4-dioxane, because I've seen some reports of it described as, quote, reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen, and the EPA has classified it as, quote, likely to be carcinogenic to humans. What does all of that mean for exposure to it in personal products? Well, in terms of personal care products and uh, household cleaning products, there is an exposure potential. Um, However, the real issue historically was with this chemical turning up in our drinking water. So just to kind of reframe this around where it was historically showing up, EPA did some work a little over 10 years ago where they had required drinking water supplies to do some testing for previously unregulated contaminants, and 1,4-dioxane was one of those. So through that testing, they actually turned up that 1,4-dioxane was showing up, especially at high levels in the drinking water in Long Island. So they were turning up some of the highest levels of 1,4-dioxane in the drinking water in the country, up to 33 parts per billion. So that was really part of the impetus for this law being put into effect in New York. Let's turn and talk a little bit about levels. What threshold for 1,4-dioxane is allowed under state law in various products, whether it's cleansing, personal care, or cosmetics? The law that was passed in New York, um, so it limited the concentration of 1,4-dioxane in household cleaning and personal care products to two parts per million starting December 31st, 2022. At the same time, it's limited the concentration of 1,4-dioxane in cosmetic products to 10 parts per million. And that level was further ratcheted down starting December 31st, 2023 
to one part per million for household cleansing and personal care products. Um, and it stayed at that same 10 part per million level for cosmetic products. Is there an expectation based on these levels about the future prevalence of 1,4-dioxane in, say, drinking water in the future? Is there an estimation that this will now mean we, we can't find it at all or that it'll be at those safer levels? So, yeah, with, with this approach, this uh, sort of pollution prevention approach to taking this chemical out of these consumer products and preventing that chemical from then making its way into the drinking water as it's used in households and then washed down the drain, there is the expectation that level of 1,4-dioxane that's showing up in groundwater and drinking water supplies will be reduced over time. Before we move on, let me reintroduce you. For listeners just joining us, this is the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Connor Shea, Section Supervisor for the Pollution Prevention Unit of the DEC's Division of Materials Management. So if the legislation spells out the uh, allowable concentration of 1,4-dioxane in certain products, what was the wiggle room involved in writing regulations? What were some of the questions that you had to answer when figuring out what this landscape looked like moving forward? Was it about, say, the certain products that would fall under these different labels? Was it about enforcement? What sort of questions did you have to answer with your regulations? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So actually, you know, we needed to kind of clarify the scope of products that were covered under this law. So there were certain product categories that were defined in the legislation that we just needed to make sure were going to be fully understood as we set forth these regulations. There was also a need, since there really wasn't a recognized and widely used testing method to measure 1,4-dioxane in these various product categories, um, we needed to set forth what we called method performance criteria when they were first launched, but it's essentially a framework for testing for 1,4-dioxane in those three different consumer product categories. So in the household cleaning products, the personal care products, and the cosmetic products. So that's something that was put into the regulations as well. And there's also a set of provisions in the regulations for how manufacturers can then use those criteria to evaluate the level of 1,4-dioxane that's in the products that they manufacture. Anything else about the regulations that you think people should know about? Yes. Yeah, so actually, there is also a provision for uh, manufacturers to apply for waivers if they needed more time to come in, into compliance with those restriction levels, the one part per million and 10 part per million levels that were set into the regulations. So essentially, a manufacturer would need to show to us that they need more time to achieve certain actions to reduce the level of 1,4-dioxane that's in the products that they manufacture, and they would need to lay out what those next steps are that they're taking and a timeline for taking those actions. So, for example, it might include things like reformulating a product so that it gets rid of some of those ethoxylated ingredients or removes 1,4-dioxane from those raw materials that often contain 1,4-dioxane. Well, sticking with the idea of waivers, Newsday reported back in 2023 that I think there were about 1,400 household products exempt from the standards. And then in 2024, it was down to about two dozen waivers. What do you think the future looks like in this space? Is it going to be maybe just a handful of products in the future that are granted waivers? Or could it ever grow to that much larger list that we saw when the law first uh, took effect? So we've actually been seeing the number of waivers being requested going down over the past couple of years. So currently we have around 1,000 products that have a current waiver. Um, however, I say products in air quotes, which you can't see because we're on a podcast. <laughs> um, but 
Uh, some of those products are actually several different UPCs of basically the same product formulation. So in some cases, a manufacturer might have several different UPCs because they have four or five different size containers of one product formulation. So there is a large number of products that are sort of encapsulated under that, that sort of scheme. Um, so it's really a, a much lower number of total product formulations that currently have a waiver. But uh, more to your point, we also worked into the regulations sort of a sunset date on the waiver provision because it really wasn't meant to go on in perpetuity. Um, it was really just meant to give manufacturers sort of a little bit of a runway to sort of come into compliance once the law went into effect and those two sets of prohibition levels went into effect in 2022 and 2023 um, because it is quite a large undertaking in some cases to reduce the amount of 1,4-dioxane that's in a in a product or in a raw material. So after December 30th, 2025, no waiver will be valid. So I have to imagine that at least in the immediate aftermath of these regulations taking effect, that enforcement is going to look primarily like education. But at what point do you transition to, I guess, a more stick-based uh, enforcement method? And at that time, what does that look like? Are we talking about, say, civil penalties? Um, well, that is something that we um, are often advised to not provide too too detailed of a comment on, on. Tie your hands, Connor. Limit limit the future right now. Go for it. <laughs> However, I would I would offer that uh, we do have the authority to test products um, and also to. Uh, request information through the compliance evaluation provisions of the regulations. Well, finally, is this a static process or is this something where you imagine revisiting these regulations in the future? Um, so this is not a static process. This is something where by law we are required to revisit and consult with the Department of Health on the restriction levels uh, to ensure that the actions being taken and that the regulations themselves are in line with the needs of New York and in line with the needs to protect our waters. Um, so that is something that we will need to do. And I believe the date set for completing that action of reviewing the levels is set for May of next year. So that's something that we will have underway shortly. And, um, you know, I believe it will result in taking the actions needed to protect New York's waters. Well, we've been speaking with Connor Shea. He's the Section Supervisor for the Pollution Prevention Unit of the DEC's Division of Materials Management. Connor, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate having the opportunity, David. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.